Hello, today I'm looking at um, Majjhimakaya number 39, the Maha Asapura Sutta, which is translated as the Greater Discourse at Asapura. So the location just mentioned is Asapura, and the people involved are the Buddha and his followers. And it's uh, the whole sutta is really uh, all about how to be a monk or a bhikkhu. And it's interesting that it starts off that a Buddha addresses the followers in the first person, so it's uh, a shared experience which comes across quite well. So as, as I say, Buddha's addressing his followers. Um, now you are perceived to be, uh, you are perceived as recluses, says Buddha, and so must practice to make one a recluse so that our designations are true our claims genuine, and so that the services of those who have robes, arms, food, resting place, and medicinal requisites we use uh, shall bring them great fruit and benefit, that our going forth shall not be in vain, but fruitful and fertile. So what makes one a recluse? What makes one a Brahmin? Be possessed of shame and fear of wrongdoing. Bodily contact is purified, clear and open, flawless and restrained, but do not disparage others on account of that. Verbal conduct shall be purified, clear and open, without disparaging others on account of that. Mental conduct shall be purified, clear and open, flawless and restrained, without disparaging others on account of that. Our livelihood shall be purified, clear and open, and so on. Guard uh, the doors of our sense faculties. On seeing something, don't grasp at its signs and fe 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 features, since if, I f if the eye faculty is left unguarded, evil and wholesome states, covetousness and grief may invade upon us. <clears throat> Practice the way of restraint. This then repeats for the ear, nose, tongue, <clears throat> body and mind faculties. Be moderate in eating. Take food neither for amusement nor intoxication. Only for the endurance and continuance of this body, for ending discomfort and for assisting the holy life. Be devoted to wakefulness. Purify our minds uh, of obstructive states. Be possessed of mindfulness and full awareness. When going forward and returning, when flexing and extending our limbs, when wearing our robes and carrying our outer robe and bowl, when eating, drinking, defecating, urinating, when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking and keeping silent, be possessed of mindfulness and full awareness. And what more is to be done? On finding a secluded resting place, returning from arms round, after his meal, the bhikkhu sits, legs folded crosswise, body erect, and establishes mindfulness. He abandons covetousness. Uh, he abandons ill will and is compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. He purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. He abandons sloth and torpor. He abandons restlessness and removes and remorse, abides unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful. He abandons doubt, unperplexed about unwholesome states. Thus the five hindrances. An analogy. Buddha then compares the release from the five hindrances as being like the gladness and joy of becoming free from debt the gladness and joy of recovery from an, a grave illness, the gladness and joy of being released from prison, or like the gladness and joy of being released from slavery, or like the gladness of joy of being a wealthy man who has successfully travelled across a desert without being robbed. Thus, having abandoned the five hindrances, secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, the bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure, 
born of seclusion. He makes the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion drench, steep, fill and pervade his whole body. And Buddha gives an analogy of its being like water being applied to dry powder. And the dry powder absorbs all the water uh, and the, becomes a mo moist ball without spilling any water. A bhikkhu then enters and abides, uh, enters upon abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. He makes the rapture and pleasure born of concentration drench, steep, fill and pervade his whole body. And this time Buddha gives the illusion of cold wa cool water entering a lake welling up and pervading the whole lake. Then with the fading away of rapture, a bhikkhu abides in equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasures with the body he enters upon the third jhana. Thus he has become pleasant abiding with equanimity and mindfulness. He makes the pleasure, divested of rapture, drench, steep, fill and pervade the body that no part of the body is unpervaded by the pleasure divested of rapture. And this time Buddha compares it to a lotus that grows and thrives in water, and the cool water drenches, steeps, fills and pervades the lotus. Again, bhikkhus, says Buddha, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu enters upon the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and has purity of mind, mindfulness due to equanimity. The monk sits pervading his body with a pure bright mind, so there is no point of, no part of his body unpervaded by the pure bright mind. And he compares this to a man covered from head to foot with a white cloth, so there would be no part of his whole body unpervaded by the white cloth. The Sutta then dis continues describing the concentrated mind being directed to the recollection of past lives, and there then follows a repeat of Majjhimakaya number four, with a man going from his, uh, and uh, Buddha uh, describes it as being like a man going from his own village to another village, and then returning to his own village. And he might think, there I stood in such a way, sat in such a way, spoke in such a way, kept silent in such a way. And from that village I went to another village, and there I stood in such a way, sat in such a way, and so on. And so too, a bhikkhu recollects his many past lives with their aspects and particulars. He recollects his manifold past lives. The bhikkhu then, with his concentrated mind, thus purified, bright and blemished, uh, free of imperfections, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attuned to imperpetibility, he directs his mind to knowledge of the passing way and reappearance of beings. Again, uh, this is a, re a repeat of Majmakaya number four follows. Seeing beings uh, ugly and beautiful, fair, fortunate and, un and unfortunate, passing away and reappearing, understands how beings pass on according to their actions. And this time Buddha compares it as though there were two houses with doors and a man standing between the houses saw people entering the houses and coming out and passing to and fro. So too a bhikkhu sees beings passing away and reappearing and he understands how beings pass on according to their actions. Then when his mind is thus purified, the bhikkhu directs it to knowledge of destruction of the taints. He understands it as it actually is. <clears throat> this is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. That is the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. There are taints. This is the origin of the taints. This is the cessation of the taints. This is the way leading to the cessation of the taints. Again, using the word asava, defilement of sense pleasures, 
uh, craving for existence, ignorance, while perpetu perpetuating the endless round of rebirth. His mind becomes liberated from the taint of sensual desire, the taint of being, the taint of ignorance. And thus comes the knowledge. Birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming into a state of being. And he compares this to a man <coughs> staring into a clear mountain lake and he can see shells, gravel, pebbles, shoals of fish. He sees it as it actually is. Buddha then continues, A bhikkhu such as this is called a recluse. One who has attained to knowledge is a holy scholar, a noble one, an arahant. And how is a bhikkhu a recluse? He is quietened down his evil and wholesome states that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripening in suffering, and lead to future birth, ageing and death. That is how a bhikkhu is a recluse. Similarly, this is how a bhikkhu is a brahmin. He has expelled uh, evil and wholesome states that defile, bring renewal of being and so on. And how is a bhikkhu one who has been washed? And here uh, bhikkhu Bodhi um, gives in his commentary an explanation that uh, when a disciple has completed his training, uh, the, he's ceremonially washed. Uh, so he has washed off his evil and wholesome states uh, that defile, bring renewal of being and so on and so forth. And how is a bhikkhu one who has attained to knowledge he has known evil and wholesome states that defile, uh, bring renewal of being and so on. And how is a bhikkhu a holy scholar? Uh, the evil and wholesome states that defile and so on have streamed away from him. And how is a bhikkhu a noble one? The evil and wholesome states are far away from him. And how is a bhikkhu an arahant? Evil and wholesome states are far away from him. And there ends the sutta number 39. Thanks for watching.